to the committee member from Chennai Menopause Society. We would like to invite you for the academic bonanza on bone health and menopause on this August uh, Wednesday evening. We would like to start the proceedings with a prayer song. I now invite Dr. T.K. Shanti Madam, President Chennai Menopause Society, Consultant of Mangalam Healthcare, Vice President of Oxy, to deliver the welcome address as well as to proceed with the lighting of the Kuttu Velakkar. Shanti, are you? Yeah. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome all the dignitaries gathered here. This is our second webinar. And uh, we have already had uh, one uh, in-person meeting too, which was a great success. And I have great pleasure in inviting Dr. Pushpa Sethi, our dynamic president of uh, Indian Menopause Society, and who has uh, who's really an accessible person too. That matters a lot for more programs being done. Thank you, Madam, for being here and uh, and for being the chief guest for this function too. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nirbla Jay Shankar, the most sought after obstetrician in Chennai and my dear friend. And I really feel very happy to have her here as guest of honor. Welcome, Nimi. Uh, uh, and it is nice to have uh, a lot of uh, learned faculty in the form of chairpersons, Dr. <clears throat> Chairani Kamaraj. Then uh, we have our uh, Preet Agarwal, we have our Sumati, then Jayshri Gopal, who is always, uh, always lends a helping hand to us, uh, I mean, in the field of endocrinology. Then Lakshmi Sundar, who really needs to be here to enlighten us. We are really grateful for that. And of course, Dr. Sumati, Director in Charge, uh, ISO KGH. And we also have the enthusiastic and uh, very enlightening panelists. Uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> again, Jayshree uh, will be helping us uh, with the panel, Deepa Tangamani, and many others. So I'm really very happy to have all of you all here. And of course, this whole program has been possible because of only the team um, CMS, Chennai Menopause Society, 2023 to 25, who has really worked as a team to bring about this uh, whole program. And I should really thank our dynamic secretary, Dynamism seems to be the word for, for specifically for her, uh, Dr. Meera Raghavan, my uh, treasurer actually, who's very good at uh, making all sorts of things uh, on the computer. And that has really helped us a great deal. And our editor, uh, Dr. Divya Ravikumar, 
we want youngsters to come up and uh, bring up the chennai menopause society and go to ims too so with all these about uh, our uh, model we are really very happy to have that here uh, our newsletters <laughs> Uh, so uh, that is possible only because of all these uh, dynamism, and uh, we also have quiz for delegates. So this is the first time we are introducing, and maybe after that people will come to know about it, and more will uh, join. And we know that osteoporosis is very very important, and that is the reason why we took up this topic, and we have excellent faculty. and i am very sure we will have a great academic time thank you i invite tk shanti madam uh, uh, dr pushpa sethi for the uh, lighting of the kutukal oh i request our chief guest and guest of honor to light uh, the kutukalak <coughs> virtually of course <laughs> invite dr meera raghavan secretary chennai menopause society to deliver the midlife prayer we pray to god to give us grace to accept the midlife physical changes and gently renew our strength guide our heart our mind and body to navigate the way and our trust in you to lead us safely through we pray for midlife and mature women who cherish the fond moments of their life and also for those sitting in a doctor's office or who are in bed asking for healing touch on this day may all the midlife and menopausal women have the gift of joy hope and good health thank you god for the promise of hope you hold out to all midlife and menopausal women and inspire us to give this gift of hope to others i now invite the chief guest for today's webinar dr pushpa sethi to deliver the address and also to release the medal one dr pushpa sethi is a senior practice uh, practicing obstetrician from gurgaon madam is the current Uh, president of indian menopause society she is also the organizing chairperson of ims con 2018 she has been the vice president of in indian menopause society previously madam has uh, done a lot of social work uh, towards uh, upbringing of uh, uh, midlife women we are very proud and privileged to have you amongst us madam the stage is yours thank you thank you so much a very very good evening to all of you and uh, at the outset let me congratulate the chennai menopause society dr shanti and everybody here for organizing this webinar and uh, when i was told uh, to um, sort of be the chief guest here i had some other commitments today but then i really wanted to be here for some time because the topic that you have chosen is very very relevant in today's time uh, there are two topics which have always um, sort of intrigued us and where we feel very uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know we are not very free to tread and that is one is msd and osteoporosis that 
that thing I always had in my mind that I want to do something here. And that is why I have come up with the clinical updates on MHT and osteoporosis. Because whenever you get a patient who has uh, who has any problem with a T-score or whether, whether uh, she has any, uh, you know, result which shows that she has osteopenia or osteoporosis, we always tend to just send her off to the orthopedician. And uh, maybe just five or ten years down the line, we would not even think of treating these patients. We thought it was an um, orthopedician's domain. But slowly and slowly as we started gaining knowledge as we started uh, enriching ourselves with the, the you know knowledge about osteoporosis how it happens how it can be prevented uh, what is the line of treatment that we have to adopt i think we are no more free now to treat it and so it happens so also it happens with mht you know we are susceptible we are uh, not so free in uh, uh, you know using mht as we should be uh, so uh, I'm very happy that you have taken up these topics and uh, very good uh, uh, topics here. Uh, it almost all covers every aspect of osteoporosis. And believe me, once you start treating these patients, you will be very happy because they will always come to you first and they will always be happy when you are the one who's treating and not sending them off to another uh, you know, doctor in another field where they probably are not that comfortable. So congratulations once again. And Chennai Medical Society has always been in the forefront of academic work. And we have such stalwarts in your uh, society. And you have done always such, such good work. I have always been very, very proud of you. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you very much. And I would like you to release our uh, I mean, e-newsletter. We have called it MADAL. MADAL means letter in Tamil. And it is, uh, it stands for Menopause Associated Disorders uh, Awareness Letter. So it is not mm -hmm. only just awareness to keep our minds uh, very active. We are introducing one Sudoku in that, uh, in each letter. And mm -hmm. also we have a lot of tips for uh, happy, healthy uh, living. And we should also know about our society. We want our juniors to take over. So something about IMS, something about CMS, just one tidbit here and there so that they really understand. That's a very good idea. We, you know, juniors have to be encouraged. And it is very heartening to see that a lot of youngsters are now joining, um, you know, Indian Menopause Society. They are all interested in menopausal medicine. So we have to encourage them. Thank you, madam. Adam, thank you for releasing the model one. Please yeah. give me one e-copy of this. It is very, very informative and very good. Okay, thank Please you. Send me an e-copy. I thank, thank my enthusiastic editorial team. I've been really pestering them so much and uh, saying a lot of corrections. Dr. Meera Raghavan, uh, Dr. Tivya, I should really thank them for that. And of course, a Chitrakala of Shield who has really obliged us a great deal. So um, a big thanks to Chitrakala. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for uh, your uh, words of wisdom. We would like. I would like to uh, call upon uh, the guest of honor for today, Dr. Nirmala Jayashankar, to deliver her address as well as release the Madal 2. Dr. Nirmala Shankar uh, is the senior consultant and obstetrician from Apollo First Med and Cradle Hospitals, Chennai. Madam needs no instruction. Like uh, TK Shanti, Madam said previously, she's the most sought after gynecologist in Chennai. And even my family members are Madam's patients. So, with that disclaimer, welcome you, Madam. Thank you. And Divya. kindly do the honors. Thank you, Divya. And uh, thank you for joining in today's program on bone health and this ever-enthusiastic, charming 
um, Indian Menopause Society Chennai team. Good luck to all of you. Your enthusiasm is so infectious. Now, when we talk about bone, our bones play a crucial role in our overall health and well-being. Okay, we tend to delegate bones as something which is not so important. The importance is mainly given to heart and brain and lungs and all that. But the, these poor bones are the ones who actually uh, provide structural support for you. They protect all the vital organs. Just imagine ourselves without bones. You just can't do any of your normal physical activity and your day-to-day -day life. So you have chosen something which is very, very good. But we all know as we age, the bones also, they tend to get um, osteoporotic with fractures, sarcopenia, general weakness and everything. But in today's pro program, we have got people to tell us what you can do proactively to make sure that you maintain a good health, even in midlife and past beyond midlife. And I'm sure with people like uh, Dr. Jay Shri Gopal, Dr. Shobhna Mahadevan, and all the other panelists. This is going to be an uh, evening of uh, good learning. And thank you, Shanti and Meera, for your invite. I'm actually privileged and wish you all the best for today's program. And I'm very happy to open. I like the word muddle, you know, which is a Tamil word for uh, a little booklet. So I'm very happy to release the muddle too. Shanti, I also like the word aha, you know, which is a lovely word to say. And so much of work has gone into put together this model. And even in parliament, the women's empowerment bill has been tabled. So I think today is a good day for us to uh, empower the women in midlife and beyond who with a rich experience will contribute a lot to the society. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you very much. Thank you, dignitaries, for your wonderful words and uh, encouragement. Uh, we will now move on to the uh, academic sessions lined up for today. We'll start with session one. I would like to invite the chairpersons of session one, Dr. Jairani Kamaraj and Dr. Preet Agarwal. Dr. Jairani Kamaraj uh, is the current president of OXI. She is the Associate Secretary of World Association of uh, Sexual Health. Madam is a well-known figure uh, in the country. She has a lot of uh, medals and awards to her credit. I would like to invite Dr. Preet Agarwal. Madam is the senior consultant and professor at Sri Ram Ramchandra uh, Institute of Higher Education and Research. Madam has been an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher for almost 25 years now. Welcome, Madam. I would like to invite the chairpersons to invite the speakers. Uh, Preet, you take over Jairani's entry. Okay, ma'am. Good evening, one and all. I first like to thank uh, Dr. Shanti Guna, madam, who has given me this opportunity to chair the session, and uh, Dr. Meera Raghavan and Dr. Dhanalakshmi, ma'am. So, first of all, I take the proud privilege to introduce Dr. Jayashri Gopal. Uh, she is a director. Diabetic Endo India Chennai, Institute of Diabetes, Endocrine, Metabolic and Lifestyle Health, founder of the trustee of uh, Diabetic Endo India Foundation, preserving health across generations. She's a diplomat of American Board in Internal Medicine, Endocrinology and Diabetes. And of course, a senior consultant and uh, endocrinologist and diabetologist, Apollo Hospital Chennai, and a vice president of Endocrine Society of Tamil Nadu and Puducherry and recipient of the Vocation Excellence Award for Rotary Club. And of course, other awarded also Dr. Sam G.P. Moses Oration at API Chennai Chapter Annual Conference. Prevention is better than cure. I invite Madam to speak on osteoporosis prevention and management. Thank you, ma'am. 
Good evening, and uh, let me first share my screen. Can you see it as a full uh, screen? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. This is always a bit of a tension time. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Dr. Shanti, Dr. Meera, and the entire Chennai Menopause team, of which I'm also a very proud part. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this uh, very important topic, uh, preventing and managing osteoporosis. Management of osteoporosis is actually relatively simple once we get used to the, uh, you know, understanding the medicines and how to use it. But prevention is where I think uh, most of our efforts should ideally lie. And uh, gynecologists seeing young girls from the age of, say, 12, 13, up to, you know, their uh, 70s, uh, you're all ideally placed to make sure that we are taking all the measures we can to prevent uh, osteoporosis. Let me just, uh, yeah. um, so osteoporosis, as we all know, refers to two things. One is a loss of the bone matrix. So when we think of osteoporosis, we think of thin bones. Uh, and this is the one that shows up as low bone mass on a, on a, on a DEXA scan, low bone density on a DEXA scan. So loss of the bone matrix. However, there is also, apart from that loss of the bone matrix, there's a decline in the microarchitecture. So the bone becomes uh, less functional or more brittle. And this is not something that can be easily picked up on a uh, on a DEXA scan. Uh, the reason why it's important to keep it in mind is because, for example, in conditions like diabetes, uh, you may have a relatively normal looking bone density, but this person with diabetes is at risk of fractures, higher risk of fractures, as compared to a person with the same bone density, but who does not have diabetes. So this decline in microarchitecture is something that we do not yet have a non-invasive way of picking up on a DEXA, and it's very important to be aware of this feature. The reason why it's particularly important in India, of course, today we are talking mainly about women, but India is one of the countries around the world where we have a very high incidence of fractures in men also. Uh, the risk of hip fractures in men starts increasing after the age of about 75. Uh, women also 75 hip fractures. And the reason why hip fractures are important is because obviously that is the one that is associated with excess mortality. But India is also one of the countries where we have a very high incidence of vertebral fractures, particularly even in younger men. So uh, uh, we have, uh, it, due to various reasons, similar to how we are at higher risk for developing, say, diabetes or cardiovascular disease at a younger age, it also appears that osteoporosis seems to strike us at a younger age. And these are some data looking at the hip fracture rates in men. And you can see that red is one of the highest uh, thing. India and China are about equally poised orange. Uh, we are a little bit worse than some other countries around the world. We have a high incidence. Most of the fractures in India, about 30% of the fractures in India are hip fractures. And it's the same all over the world, apart from Africa. Most of the fractures, particularly those that are related to aging, uh, particularly related to menopause and aging, tend to be hip fractures, followed by uh, fractures of the other low bones in the lower extremities like the tibia and wrist fractures. So these are the common fractures that we see. So like I said, the main reason why we are particularly concerned about hip fractures and we need to reduce the risk is because uh, um, a fracture which occurs at any site, whether it be the hip or the, uh, the vertebrae, is associated with uh, an increased mortality. So for about six to 10 years after a fracture, there is a higher risk of dying, not directly from the fracture, but it portends some other, say some development of infection or some other thing, you know, reduce motility, uh, maybe a pulmonary embolism. So it portends some other start of some other morbidity, which further increases the risk of dying. So, and the greatest reduction in survival occurs in the first one year after a fracture. So anytime we see an elderly person with a fracture, we need to make sure that they are up and moving about and getting their health back into order soon after the fracture. It is estimated that one in 11 women and one in seven uh, men following a non-hip and correspondingly one in five women and one in three men following a hip fracture 
will die within the first one year after a fracture. So this is the reason why particularly it is important that we reduce the risk of a fracture. Now, preventing fractures involves not only uh, uh, screening and treating for osteoporosis, but for preserving the bones. Uh, Dr. Lakshmi, who's going to be talking uh, after me, will be talking more about this part of it, preserving bones, but I'll talk a little bit about it from my, my aspect. When we talk about preserving bone strength, there are three things we need to think about. One is preserving the actual density of the bone. So the bone mineral density, which comes down to diet and exercise, I'll touch upon that. But also it's important that we preserve muscles. Muscles are as important for bone density and bone strength uh, as uh, is the bone strength itself. So preserving muscles is very important. And I think most important is preventing falls. So the reason why you fracture a bone is not because of osteoporosis. The reason you fracture a bone is because of the fall. So as we get older, there is a reduction in our ability to balance. So proprioception comes down. The ability of uh, the, the proprioceptive signals that we get from, say, the ankle, from the knee, uh, all of these organs tend to come down with age, which is why, for example, if, uh, if you have a momentary imbalance or somebody pushes you, an older person is more likely to fall. So these are the three things we need to be addressing from a young age to reduce the risk of a fracture following a fall. Uh, it is estimated that falls become more common as we get older. In fact, one third of all people over the age of 65 years suffer a fall. Half of all people over the age of 80 years suffer a fall. But obviously not all of them suffer a fracture. About 5% of these will go on to suffer a fracture. What are the risk factors that determine uh, the risk for falls. What are the risk factors for falls? One is a prior history of a fall. So if you, let's say you have an elderly lady who comes and says, oh, I just tripped and fell in the bathroom or I just fell momentarily giddy and I fell. It's important to know that this is a person who's another at risk for a second fall. Muscle weakness, poor balance, visual impairment. Cataracts are one of the most important factors for falls. Polypharmacy, particularly the use of uh, a large amount of medications for uh, blood pressure, but also sedatives, uh, neuropathic agents. They may be on it for, say, complaints of burning, pain. So polypharmacy is a very common reason for falls. Of course, usage of other uh, types of medication, environmental hazards, we are very well aware of this, loose mats, wires, etc. But also other medical conditions, arthritis, where they're not able to uh, stand up suddenly or get up and go suddenly, cognitive impairment, Presence of Parkinson's, diabetes, depression, urinary incontinence, a very common problem in older women, which increases risk for falls. Of course, alcohol consumption, a sudden stroke may cause a person to fall or syncope. So these are all the risk factors for falls. But after a fall, what is, what is it that determines whether you actually fracture a bone? Of course, one of the most important things is a low bone density. But in general, these are the other risk fractures. A female is more likely to fracture a bone after a fall than a male. The older you are, when you fall, you're more likely to fracture. Having had a previous fall, even you might not have fractured a bone earlier, but with a second or third fall, you may fracture a bone. Of course, steroid use, rheumatoid arthritis, a person who is uh, thin, low BMI, and presence of visual impairment have been shown in several studies to be independently associated with the risk of a fracture after a fall. So you can see that if you have an elderly person with a, say, on steroids for COPD, who's had a cataract surgery, who's had a couple of falls, this is a person in whom we have to be concentrating our efforts to both reduce the risk of a fall and to reduce the risk of a fracture after a fall. Diabetes is one of the other major risk factors for both falling and fracturing a bone after falling because of uh, an acceleration of uh, loss of muscle mass and function. And higher the HPA1C, lower your muscle mass and function. So diabetes is an independent risk factor, both for falling and for fracturing a bone after a fall. Interestingly, fall is not a normal part of aging. We assume that we get older, we're going to lose our balance, we're going to fall. Apparently, aging causing disability only happens purely because of aging only happens after the age of 94 years. Uh, the earlier age fragility that we say, you know, we see someone who's maybe in the mid 80s and we say it's old age. This occurs more often because of other factors like uh, uh, multiple infarcts, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, depression. Most important is loss of fitness and deconditioning, which is what Dr. Lakshmi is going to be talking about. And this general belief that as we get older, we have to accept 
being less active and less uh, 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 you know less agile uh, so these are the problems that occur as we get older but falls are not a normal part of aging of course there are things that we need to do to our environment to prevent falls and uh, uh, these are things that all of us talk about install handrails particularly in the in poorly lit areas uh, in the bathrooms make sure that you have non slip mats and uh, install grab bars so next to the uh, next to the commode in the bathroom installing uh, hand bars repair steps and steps and flooring make sure that there is nothing uh, crumbling remove uh, wires so simple things that we can do these are all common sense things but to prevent a fall i think one of the most important things is to prevent sarcopenia and to maintain balance and flexibility as we get older and we need to be talking about this we need to work on it for ourselves and we need to be talking about it to our patients sarcopenia is something like osteopenia sarcopenia is defined as progressive and generalized skeletal muscle disorder that is associated with increased likelihood of adverse outcomes it's a combination of low muscle strength and quantity or quality which leads to a decline in your physical performance there are ways in which you can actually assess muscle strength very quickly for example some simple things you can do grip strength you can do chair stand strength how long how many times or how long does it take for a person to get up from a chair and sit down five times these are all very basic types of tests you can do more advanced testing things that they may sometimes do in a physiotherapy assessment or things that they may do in a uh, in a in a uh, more advanced uh, clinic gait speed how long do you take to uh, walk 4 meters there are many sort of uh, these types of tests available uh, do you need assistance in walking and all of that so i'm not going into detail in this but the other important aspect of muscle mass that we need to address uh, is apart from the sarcopenia is balance uh, balance occurs because of a combination of it all gets um, uh, ultimately the, the 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 center of it is a cerebellum but we get senses from the proprioceptive receptors from the vestibular uh, centers and from the visual centers so all three acting together helps us maintain our balance as we get older we tend to lose proprioception we tend to obviously have problems with vision and our vestibular system also gets affected which is why we are uh, less likely to balance out to external perturbations which is why an older person if they have a sudden push they go to a crowded area they get a sudden push they are more likely to fall so ideally that we should be talking to them if you are serious about reducing their risk of osteoporosis and fractures we should be talking to them also about balance exercises how do we maintain bmd beyond muscle and balance and all of these things diet and exercise a diet which is rich in fruits vegetables legumes with uh, less of red meat and sweets so less of direct added sugars red meat the diets which have higher levels of this have a lower bone density diets which are anyway healthy for other reasons for your heart and for you know for the diabetes which is better for the bone density uh india is one of the countries which has a relatively low uh, uh uh calcium intake so our general average calcium intake is around 400 to 500 mg per day on an average all across the country what is recommended is around 1000 mg per day that we are all familiar with here i put up some indian foods the the you know in india we have a large percentage of vegetarians so what are some of the indian vegetarian foods that can increase calcium intake of course we know about dairy so milk and curd but also ragi uh, kull um, uh, sesame so yellu yellu or sesame or till these are all very important in, uh, uh, sources of calcium and drumstick leaves murunga ela that we say in tamil this is a very good source of calcium and also arakera seeds so you can add this to your parathas so this arakera seeds all of these are good soya is a good source of decent source of calcium uh this was a good paper which listed out how much of calcium you get apart from milk some other very good sources are uh, amaranth leaves what is molakeira in tamil uh, also mustard seeds what we use for seasoning uh, kadugu that's also a decent source of calcium apart from all the things that i mentioned earlier uh, till oil nalla enna gingerly gingerly seed oil is a good source of calcium so uh, over a period of time even if you are vegetarian you will feel not able to take dairy because of various reasons if you include all of these things a lot of greens particularly this murunga ele yellu 
uh, ragi, you will get a decent amount of calcium in the diet. We need to be very physically active. I'm not going to go into detail and let Lakshmi uh, deal with this. I'll move on to basically what the guidelines are talking about, who should be screened for osteoporosis. This is the ISBMR, the Indian Society for Bone and Mineral Research, what they say about who needs to be screened for osteoporosis. All women age 60 and older and men age 65 and older, regardless of other clinical risk factors. So irrespective of whatever the other risk factor you may have, any woman above the age of 60, man above the age of 65, should have a bone density done, a DEXA scan done. If, if you have a younger woman or man, if there are concerns for osteoporosis, let's say they've been on steroids or they have a history of rheumatoid arthritis or they have a history of a fragility fracture, some other reason why you might consider that you can do a DEXA uh, bone density test in that. You can also do it for women in the menopausal transition if they have other risk factors. So low body weight, uh, if they are on high risk medications like steroids, then you can consider doing uh, 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 bone density. So, but in general, at least we need to remember that all women above the age of 60 should be screened with a DEXA scan. And is a DEXA scan enough? Uh, not enough. Apart from a bone density test, the DEXA scan, we should also do vertebral imaging. So we need to do in all women about 70 years and older and all men age 80 and older, if, the, if they are osteopenic, then we have to do vertebral imaging. So both the thoracic and the lumbar spine a lateral view x-ray has to be uh, taken. So in older people, if the T-score is less than one, in younger women, if the T-score is less than 1.5. So if they are, the simpler way that I remember is anybody who's osteopenic also make sure that you've had an x-ray done or sometimes I just get both together instead of sending them again for an osteopenic uh, for an x-ray. Apart from getting a DEXA scan, apart from getting an x-ray, what else do we need to do? Obviously, some basic tests like a complete blood count, uh, the uh, uh, you know sugars, of course, and urea, creatinine, thyroid, vitamin D. You don't really need to do a 24-hour urine calcium and all that, but basic tests need to be done. These other tests are done for people who have secondary osteoporosis. We don't need to worry about this. But basic tests, at least, we need to do. The measures, apart from what I spoke about in terms of exercise and uh, balance exercises and muscle mass exercises, we need to make sure that we're maintaining adequate calcium intake. Like I said earlier, that's about 1000 mg per day. Uh, 1000 mg per day would be at least about a uh, minimum of about three liters of, uh, sorry, uh, one liter of milk will give you roughly about 750 milligrams of calcium. And then you can add other things to it to make up your 1000 mg per day. Adequate vitamin D intake. So vitamin D has to be around, uh, ideally somewhere around 200 to 800 IU per day. Uh, currently, it is recommended that it's better to get the calcium from uh, food sources rather than giving it as a supplement separately, unless they have a low calcium or they cannot supplement enough through the diet. But vitamin D in general, it is important that we supplement all older people. As we get older, our body's ability to make vitamin D in the skin on sun exposure becomes less. So at a minimum, you can supplement everybody above the age of 50 years with at least 1,000 to 2,000 IU of vitamin D per day. We have to limit alcohol and stop smoking. We also need to limit caffeine intake because caffeine is one of the other things which leaches out calcium from bones. And of course, exercise is very important, active exercise. Uh, vitamin D, we try to need to try and maintain it between 30, about 30 uh, nanogram per ml and usually like I said in the range of 1000 to 2000 IU per day calcium 1000 to 1200 mg per day so these are the recommendations when do we start pharmacological therapy any person who's had a fracture so either it can be a vertebral fracture which is apparent uh, someone who's fallen and the x-ray shows a fracture or sometimes we only find a fracture on x-ray which is the importance of getting a a thoracic and a lumbar x-ray down, or a history of a non-vertebral fracture. So particularly a fracture which is done after a minimal trauma. So say a fall from a standing height, just a slip in the bathroom and they've either fractured their tibia or their wrist. It's important to consider starting uh, uh, pharmacological measures. If they have osteoporosis, significant osteoporosis, so a T-score of less than minus 2.5 technically puts them in the osteoporotic range. So if they are above 50 years with a T-score of less than 2.5 as measured by the DEXA, they need to be started on therapy. If they have osteopenia, 
then we need to calculate their FRAC score. What is their 10 year risk of a fracture? If you go online and just put in the FRAC, uh, just put FRAC score India, you'll get one data sheet. In the data sheet, you have to enter height, weight, you have to put in things like, has there been any previous fracture, family history of fracture, are they on steroids, history of pneumatoid arthritis, like that, you fill it in. And it will also ask you for the actual bone density at the uh, spine. So you need to have the DEXA report with you. If you put it in, it will give you a 10-year probability of a hip fracture, 10-year probability of a non-hip fracture, other major fracture, which would be a vertebral fracture or a risk fracture. So if that risk of a hip fracture is more than 3%, or the major osteoporosis related fracture is more than 10% on a FRAC scoring. Even with osteopenia, we need to get them started on pharmacological therapy. If they have diabetes, your, uh, your, uh, it is recommended. Again, these are all guidelines from the ISBMR guidelines. If they have diabetes, then you would consider starting treatment even when they have uh, the diabetes itself is considered as a positive risk score in that uh, FRAC scoring system. So any fracture, particularly vertebral or major hip fracture in a person about the age of 50 warrants pharmacological therapy. What is the pharmacological therapy that needs to be given? The first line therapy is usually a bisphosphonate. Uh, Zolodronic acid, alindronic acid, ibandronic acid. Uh, these are considered the first line therapies uh, or denosumab. So the only difference is in the method of administration. Alendronate is given orally weekly once. Ibandronate is given orally monthly once. Zolidronate is given yearly once IV. Donosumab is given as a subcutaneous injection once in six months. Teriparatide is used a lot by orthopedic surgeons. It's definitely helpful in the presence of severe osteoporosis and vertebral fractures. It's usually given for about six months to two years prior to bisphosphonates. Calcitonin, intranasal calcitonin is used only for pain relief. There is absolutely no data that it helps in reducing future risk of fracture. So the pharmacotherapy for osteoporosis is this. Once you get them started on pharmacotherapy, make sure they have adequate calcium, vitamin D. You've gotten them started on pharmacotherapy, exercise, walking. Check their vitamin D levels every six months. We need to do an x-ray spine annually, especially if they have new or worsening back pain. If people are on bisphosphonates and they complain of thigh pain, we need to get an x-ray of the femur because sometimes they develop what is called an atypical fracture. DEXA scan can be repeated after one to two years. And we have certain criteria to say when is the medication not working, when do we need to consider switching medication and all that. I'm not going into detail there, but there is a concept of treatment failure. Also, the question always comes, how long should we use pharmacological therapy? Bisphosphonates, if the bone density is stable, you give a drug-free holiday after four to five years. So after four to five years of a uh, alendronate or zolidronate or ibandronate, uh, stop it for a year or two and measure the bone density. But denosumab is indefinite use and teriparatide is one to two years. Apart from that, we cannot continue to use teriparatide. Denosumab has to be continued regularly. We cannot stop it. It has to be given every six months indefinitely. So these are the guidelines from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists about treatment of postmenopausal osteoporosis. You can see that if they have a high risk of fracture but no prior fractures, the treatment is these, what I said, alendronate, denosumab, residronate, and zolidronate. Uh, if they have a very high risk of a fracture or prior fractures, similar, denosumab or zolidronic acid or teriparatide, all the medications that I mentioned. HRT does not find a place in management of osteoporosis at present. HRT currently is only recommended for management of, uh, of, of, osteo of, of menopausal symptoms, but not for treatment of osteoporosis. For treatment of osteoporosis, once you find that you have all of these criteria, they fit the criteria, the treatment is considered to be uh, non-hormonal. So these bisphosphonates or denosumab are what is currently recommended. There are certain situations where we need to screen for uh, secondary causes of osteoporosis. Uh, rather than going into this, I think I want to just spend last two minutes talking about this. Remember that certain medications, proton pump inhibitors, SSRIs and thiazolidinediones increase the risk of a fracture. So we should not be giving these drugs indiscriminately. You should refer doc, uh, patients with osteoporosis fragility factors to ideally an endocrinologist uh, who deals with say other secondary causes of osteoporosis, we see a lot of people who present with say either prolactin problems or hyperparathyroidism problems or other calcium related issues, which causes loss of bone density at a young age. 
So for example, when a person with a normal BMD sustains a fracture without major trauma, if you have continued bone loss or recurrent fractures in a patient receiving therapy, then it needs to be referred to the endocrinologist. If the osteoporosis is unexpectedly severe at a young age, uh, or if they have other features like malabsorption, rheumatoid arthritis, better to refer to the uh, endocrinologist. So to summarize, I spoke about how fractures or falls or fracture after a fall is not an inevitable part of growing old. But what is important is that we start looking after the bones. When they come to us at the age of 20, 25, 30 for fertility, irregular periods, we need to start talking to them about exercise from that age. And we need to start screening them from after the age of 60 or after the age of 50 if there are other risk factors. A healthy diet, making sure they're consuming enough calcium, vitamin D, and also greens for vitamin K is important. And of course, adequate protein and regular exercise. Screening, I spoke about who needs to be screened and who, need, who needs to be treated and when. And fall prevention is the most important thing in uh, helping to reduce the risk of a fracture. That was my last slide, I think. Thank you. And yeah, we have a World Osteoporosis Day. Uh, sorry. Yeah. This year, the, the theme is Build Better Bones, which is all the things that we talk about. Exercise, vitamin D, uh, healthy body weight, no smoking, uh, maintaining a bone healthy diet, uh, avoid excessive alcohol intake and regular exercise. These are all that are, are what is recommended for the World Osteoporosis Day to help us build better bones. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank, Thank you, you for the... Ma'am, carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, madam. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And it is really, you have put forth everything in a very beautiful way, in a very concise way, very crisp to learn about the who are all the people ideal for screening and how to go about the DEXA scan and how to treat, when to treat, the risk of the fractures, everything you have put forth very nicely. And very interestingly, you have told about the HRP, its role in the uh, osteoporosis, as we wrongly believe that HRD can be a treatment, it should be avoided. Ideally speaking, insisting on the diet is very important, especially our Indian diet, which is very good in calcium, which gives a very good calcium supplement. It's, it's very important. Only one thing I just want to ask you, is there, uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of negative things about a continuous intake of calcium, especially in the menopause. What is your, as a say, as how to take, what are all the guidelines will you advise? Will you take a continuous way or you want to give a gap? Because sometimes we give them empirically, most of the gynec. So what is it when the patient asks you, how have I go, go about it? What is your say about this, ma'am? So in general, the currently it is recommended that you get your calcium from the diet. Uh, in our country, however, I think it's okay to give one, at least like a 500 mg of calcium tablet and then let them take whatever other calcium they want. If they are a person who's consuming a very healthy diet, they're having lots of all of these things, milk and curd and ragi, all of these things, then maybe they don't require a calcium supplement. But otherwise, with the amount of milk and curd we consume in our country, and I've always said this, the cows in our country are also calcium deficient. So we don't know how much calcium our milk has. So because of that, I think it's okay to give them, you know, the usual 500 mg. Uh, I don't think there's any, the only time I don't use it is if they have a history of kidney stones. In that situation, I just tell them, just make sure you get it from your diet. Don't take a calcium tablet separately. Otherwise, you can give it. Indefinitely, you can give it. But I would not use more than 500 mg for long-term purposes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Question, Thank you for your talk. Yeah. Ma'am, just one question. Apart from giving routinely calcium and vitamin D, do you recommend it, recommend the medication like zolidonic acid and uh, the denosobab for all the patients, like postmenopausal lady? Is it good to take those injections and tablets? That's what. That? So, I mean, that's why I went through the indications for treatment. Yeah. If they have had a fracture, yeah. yes. If they have no. if they have osteoporosis, yes. If they have osteopenia, you have to calculate the frac score. Yeah. Not routinely, huh? oh. not so, routinely yeah. because some not of the, the patient no, no, no. says you can take one injection. Okay. No, 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 that's four. We have to calculate, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, 
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the, the wonderful delegation. Yeah. Thank you. Ma'am, will you introduce the next speaker, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll Dr. Lakshmi. Yeah. Me Sundar. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to introduce Madam Dr. Lakshmi Sundar, who is a board certified lifestyle medicine physician, who is the secretary of the Indian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Madam has graduated from Stanley Medical College in 1990, and she has been trained in diabetic foot surgery in the VHS. And she's a very passionate physician working in managing NCDs through an evidence-based approach. And she has trained in food biomechanics at Staffordshire University as a part of the EU-funded EU research. And she's a passionate long-distance runner. That is very great and amazing that she is doing a lot of uh, running. And she's the president of the Chennai Runners, which is really inspirational for most of us. Who are very much uh, uh, need this an inspiration from you, ma'am. So nice to introduce you, ma'am. Uh, let me uh, welcome you on behalf of Chennai Menopause Society, uh, and I hand over to you to speak on a very important topic that's the lifestyle interventions in bone health after menopause, which is very much mandatory as we are thinking of the drug, drugs, food, and exercise. You will be giving a very comprehensive approach of how we can prevent. The I mean improve our bone health after menopause without medications with and they prevent us from landing into the hips hip fractures and other major fractures. Over to you, ma'am, for your speech. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Thanks, Dr. Meera, for having me over. And yeah, this is a huge learning for me also. It was lovely listening to Jayashree, whom I'm meeting virtually after a very long time. Uh, shall I start this screen share? I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, good evening, everybody. I, I know there are a lot of star words here. Uh, Dr. Nirmala, whom we've heard a lot about, I think many of my friends went to her terribly and she was a leading obstetrician then, and she continues to be a leading obstetrician. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to um, talk about lifestyle interventions for bone health. And I'll be running through all the pillars of lifestyle medicine, because lifestyle medicine is just not about nutrition and exercise. We do have, uh, we do deal with that sleep, stress and so on and so forth. So I would touch upon all the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine is an evidence-based medicine uh, practiced by allopathic doctors. Uh, we use it mainly to prevent, manage, and sometimes reverse non-communicable disorders. And we continue to see more and more patients with um, autoimmune disorders, osteoporosis, so on and so forth. Um, not going to talk too much about it. I think Jayesh has already uh, spoken about prevalence of osteoporosis. Well, thinner bones in women and a declining estrogen levels add on to the burden of osteoporosis. Uh, I just uh, went through this study where like uh, in India, 8 to 62% is the prevalence of osteoporosis, osteopenia across age groups. So it's just not the postmenopausal women. It starts even earlier, osteopenia. So it's very important that we start working towards prevention at a very young age. The causes, we all know age, yes, gender women being more susceptible than men. Of course, men also have osteoporosis. Ethnicity, um, Indians, Asians are at more risk, probably because of the increasing visceral adiposity that we see in Indians. That could be one of the risk factors. But uh, as race, we are uh, more prone to osteoporosis and genetic factors. Of course, in lifestyle medicine, we believe that genes do not decide our destiny. It's the environmental triggers that, um, you know, decide whether we are going to inherit or not. We believe a lot on the epigenetic modifications. The modifiable risk factors, nutritional factors, women in India especially take the back seat when it comes to nutrition. I still hear a lot of women tell me, educated, uh, working women tell me, no, I don't focus much on my nutrition because I need to care for my family. The nutritional factors, calcium and vitamin D especially. We are a society, we are uh, a community of people that uh, work from one air-conditioned environment to another. 
uh, severe so motor to vitamin D deficiency. Uh, nutritional status, there is a positive link between uh, BMI and bone mineral density. A sedentary lifestyle, well, increasingly we see a lot of sedentary lifestyle, medication like steroids, and the previous history of fracture for some reason makes one susceptible to osteoporosis. The good news, bone health is completely, poor bone health is completely preventable and it's manageable. So when do we start these interventions so at any age, ideally? Um, at any age, you could start lifetime interventions. Ideally, of course, start them very young because the peak bone mass is achieved during adolescence. And thereafter, it is only the maintenance between the age of 20 and 50, how we maintain our bone mass. So interventions, good if they started really early. Uh, but age is not a deterrent to start lifestyle interventions. So I'm going to run through the five pillars. I will talk about the sixth one also. Uh, a lot of importance, nutrition, yes, and exercise. Both become very uh, equally important when it comes to bone health. Well, I am going to run through, uh, well, you'll hear me talk about plant diversity as I move on. Lifestyle medicine, we believe a lot in whole food, plant predominant diet. Uh, because uh, a plant predominant diet gives you all the nutrients that you require without uh, the excess of fat and the hormones that come from animal food. Uh, when it comes to protein, there are several uh, dietary guidelines. Canadian Dietary Society talks about consuming predominantly plant proteins. Consume protein, but uh, predominantly a plant protein. Diversity of vegetables, legumes, soy, and whole grains will take care of the entire protein requirement. I am, um, I, am I, I do a lot of fitness. I can tell you that my protein source is completely uh, from plants. They also talk about, um, evidence talks about plant proteins having a lower potential renal acid load uh, because it has lower sulfur-containing amino acids uh, like methionine and cysteine. Uh, there are a lot of... Um, um, unvalidated things about animal proteins increasing, causing leaching of calcium from the bone. The, the study is still not being, it's not yet been validated, but they believe that the acid in the animal protein can buffer it, can, can be leached from bones because they have seen increased excretion of calcium in the urine and people who consume excess of animal proteins. I'm talking about excess of animal proteins here. Uh, soy and amaranth. The Rajgira is called or the, the Kira Vedai, Amaran, uh, are excellent sources of complete protein. And they are easily available in the Indian diet, easy to add them. Soy is rich in phytonutrients, it promotes bone health and strength. The other advantage of soy is it has phytoestrogen, which exerts the same effect, estrogenic effect of bones. So in a phase of estrogen deficiency, it's good to have a lot of soy in the diet. Um, as we all know, bone uh, forms about 25% of the dry weight of bone and uh, proteins, sorry. And it's a major component of the uh, collagen matrix, the bone matrix. Uh, it's a, it forms a very uh, important component and uh, it contributes to about 25% of the dry weight. Now, protein consumption becomes very, very important, roughly one gram per kilogram body weight. As you grow older, you need to increase because of the sarcopenic effects that we have as we age. So it's very important that the protein consumption goes up as we grow older and also in the very young. Um, otherwise, about easy to get one gram per kilogram body weight of protein in a day-to-day -day diet. But unfortunately, Indians are deficient in their protein because they do not consume enough legumes in their diet. The legume consumption is really poor. Fat. Very important part of our diet, but what kind of fat is very important? It has to be a whole fat, which means that's not that which is not strip fiber. Uh, saturated fat is inversely linked to the bone mineral density, and in an ideal diet, it has to be less than ten percent of your total calorie intake. Uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids are positively related to BMD at the hip and lumbar spine. Um, the best source being the seeds of uh, so chia, flax, hemp uh, seeds are, they should form an important part, even your pill should form an important part of your daily diet. 
best way to consume them, crush them before you consume. They release more nutrients when they are crushed, not when they are intact. Uh, omega-6, omega-3 balance is very important. We know omega-6 oil, especially vegetable oils, are negatively linked to uh, BND. And in uh, lifestyle medicine, when we follow a whole food diet, we consume very, very, very minimal oil. I, I don't consume oil at all. My fat source is completely whole food. But when we ask our patients, we ask them to minimize the oil consumption. Uh, extra virgin olive oil has positive impact because of the uh, MUFA and the MUFA content in it. Carbohydrates. Many of us don't like the word carbs, but then I can tell you the whole carbs are really good. The fruits and the vegetables are alkaline in nature. Um, they kind of have a buffering effect on the acid to be consumed. They have a huge anti-inflammatory effect. They are rich in antioxidants and uh, the different ingredients that you get from your diet, like vitamin C and K, they all have a protective role against bone loss. Fiber. Many people, many people, including the vegetarians, are deficient in fiber. Uh, if ideal fiber consumption, about 25 grams for women and 38 grams for men. Uh, fibers, we know, increase fiber intake, uh, produces more short-chain fatty acids which improves absorption of nutrients. And the inositol contains in fruits. They are beneficial in preserving bone and postmenopausal women. When I say diversity, I al always ask my patients to include vegetables that they have never bought in their life, fruits that they have never eaten. It's so important to preserve. And uh, inositol source, all your citrus fruits, oranges are rich in inositol. Your malambaram uh, is very rich in uh, uh, inositol. So you don't have to go you know, hunting for it, what is available as the best. In Indian diets, we get them very, very, very easily. And uh, a study diet done in a Vietnamese group and a Chinese group have found that there is no difference in bone mineral density uh, just because someone is on a vegan diet. Um, so being just on a vegan diet doesn't reduce your bone mineral density. Now, um, I'm going to talk about very specific uh, micronutrients that are required for bone health. Uh, now, when you are following a plant diverse food, you will get one of them. But uh, each vitamin has a role to play. Vitamin A, it has uh, people who consume good amounts of vitamin A. There's an inverse relationship to the uh, bone turnover mark markers, um, which means uh, uh, the easiest available uh, vitamin A source we all know is carrots. Then the lycopene-rich food like tomatoes and sweet potatoes, they are excellent sources of vitamin A. Vitamin D, most people, forget the postmenopausal group. Uh, I come across young adults having vitamin D in their single digit. This is simply because we do not expose ourselves to sunlight and also because a darker pigment, we know that it doesn't absorb vitamin D that well. And uh, so it's very important that we all supplement with vitamin D. Uh, after checking our levels, whether it's a, a daily supplemental dose or a therapeutic dose that our blood reports will uh, tell us. Uh, vitamin D, other than the bone health, we know that it's very, very important for bone health. It also has a role to play in the muscles, the type 2 muscle fibers, which are very important. They come into action when we are to stop falls. So to stop someone from falling, we need to type 2 muscle fiber. Vitamin D has a huge role to play in promoting uh, growth of type 2 muscle fibers as well. So it's very important that we take enough amounts of vitamin D supplement um, based on whatever our blood reports are and to keep it between a 30 to 60 nanogram. Uh, vitamin B12, again, because of the role that it has to play in homocysteine, it has a role to play in reducing the homocysteine levels, uh, which can favor a healthy bone. So vitamin B12, again, it's just not vegans who are deficient in B12. I've seen this across strata, people having B12 levels like 100, um, 200. Uh, so it's very, very important that vitamin B12 supplementation is also done, not just through tablets, also through a healthy, fiber-rich diet. Um, vitamin C, we all know that it has a role to play in uh, maintaining the collagen matrix of the bone. Um, all citrus fruits are rich in um, uh, 
uh, vitamin C. Vitamin C also inhibits uh, osteoclast. So uh, all the all your citrus fruits, your berries, your kiwis, uh, bell peppers, um, all that are rich in uh, vitamin C. I mentioned about vitamin K. Uh, this is very important. Vitamin K is role to play in the formation of the osteoblasts and in the uh, maintenance of your bone health. Um, so all your greens have enough of vitamin K, green colored vegetables. Vitamin K2, it promotes good gut health. Uh, so available in all your fermented food it is necessary for maintaining a healthy bone matrix. So, so the reason I'm, I'm just, um, you know, uh, kind of a case, building a case for a plant diversity because you don't have to go looking for each of these ingredients. When you have diversity on your plate, all the colors on your plate, the nutrition comes automatically. Minerals, word on calcium. Calcium, we all know, is vital for mineral for bone health. Um, calcium supplementation, as Jayshree said, not advisable. Uh, because um, calcium renal stones formation as one, and also there are there's a meta analysis uh, of several RCTs having about more than twelve thousand participants, and also the Epic Germany study has found people who are on calcium supplements to have more atherosclerotic heart disease and uh, myocardial infarctions. So calcium is a very delicately balanced mineral. Uh, we know that a lot of hormones and vitamin D comes into play in maintaining that homeostasis. A supplementation can disturb that homeostasis. Now, there are different calcium-rich foods. Now, we know that the bioavailability of calcium from each of these varies. Like, dairy doesn't have a great bioavailability of calcium. It's just about 33% bioavailable. Whereas, the calcium in greens and tofu, it's about close to 60%, more than 35% bioavailable. Now, uh, there is a study done in Sweden. Sweden is the highest consumer of dairy. There is no reduction in the fracture rate, even though they are the largest consumers of dairy. Similarly, a study done in children has said a fracture rate doesn't come down just because children consume more dairy. Uh, there is calcium in sesame seeds, chia, legumes, almonds, everything. There's a moderate bioavailable. Uh, it's somewhere in the range of about 25 to 30. Uh, so different sources of calcium will ensure that you get enough calcium for your daily requirement. Phosphorus and calcium, very important for bone health. Uh, phosphorus to calcium ratio in 0.5 to 1.5, that's a ratio. 85% uh, of the bone has phosphorus. It's found in all your bean legumes, in the seeds, pumpkin seeds especially, have a good source of uh, phosphorus. Magnesium has a very mitogenic effect on osteoblasts. It's found in your fruits and veggies and whole grains, nuts and seeds. Zinc, again, it's a structural component of your matrix. Uh, sprouting your legumes will increase the availability of zinc. So it's good to add on sprouts to your diet once in a week. Again, silicon um, is important for bone formation. It's present in your green French beans, carrots. Uh, they all have some nuts and seeds also have silicon. Copper and mang uh, manganese, again, uh, excessive intake. People do supplement. I've seen people consuming uh, supplements of multivitamins and minerals and all that stuff. Manganese, excess of manganese in your food uh, as a supplement can cause cognitive impairment, can cause Parkinsonism. So uh, we see the generation of people who do pop in a lot of supplements thinking that it's going to help them. And again, your beans and your dried fruits and your apricots, all of them have enough of copper and manganese. Uh, boron consumption extends the half-life of uh, vitamin D. So it's important. It's present and again, raisins have a good uh, uh, amount of boron in them. So do we need to eat them every day? No. Rotate. Rotate uh, the seeds that you have. Rotate the dry fruits that you have. Um, make your plate as diverse as possible. If you've had red rice one day, have a millet the other day. So that's the way you balance out your plate with uh, diverse plant food. And it makes your meal health tasty also because there's so much of diversity in the plant kingdom. Some sources, yeah. 
So the recommendation with regard to diet would be make it a whole food plant predominant diet, which is low in saturated fat naturally, because excess visceral adiposity we know is associated with both sarcopenia and a low DMT. It's plant diversity that keeps us healthy, keeps the gut healthy, thereby it increases the absorption of the minerals also. So it's important that you bring in a whole lot of diversity. This is with regard to nutrition. Physical activity. I can tell you why physical activity. Starting it at any age doesn't matter. I started running when I hit, when I was in my perimenopause. And I started exercising just about four or five years back as in um, strength training. And I had a fall a week ago exactly in the gym when I was exercising. I stood on the wrong side of the bar. The bar came off and I fell from a height flat on the ground, hitting my spine completely. Everyone thought I was going to have a fracture. Fortunately, I didn't fracture my lumbar or thoracic spine. I'm eight years post-menopause. Um, it was just ended with a small little, you know, uh, muscle injury here and there, but then I didn't fracture my spine. Uh, I think that's because of the activity that I've been doing. I've been lifting a lot of weights, and that's helped me a lot in preserving uh, my bone mentalities. Uh, so when do you start exercising very early in life? Start in childhood, weight-bearing exercises. Very important starting them early in life because uh, during the adolescence when the bone mass is uh, improving, that effect carries on to adulthood, right? But if you continue to stay sedentary during adulthood, it's not going to improve things. It's only going to worsen things. But it does have some certain effect into your adulthood also. Resistance training, which is when you move your part against an external resistance, which could be a band, which could be your own body weight, that is the best stimulus for, uh, it's the best osteogenic stimulus because the muscle ends are attached to your bone. When you move against resistance, they do stimulate the osteoblast. Um, for children, low reps, high intensity loading, at least three times a week is what is needed. The duration of the exercise, there's no um, data on it as such there's no recommended duration even a 10 12 minute high intensity loading would suffice doing it two times a day has a better effect than doing it just once a day so children should be allowed to be as active as possible into uh, as adults resistance training as i said is the best modality of uh, physical inactivity which most of us go through from our 20s to our 50s, I would say, and in the 21st sense, they can cause a gradual decline in the bone mental density. Even something like walking can have a positive effect on your BMD. A repetitive high intensity walking, not a slow day walking, a high intensity walking brisk walk where you can only chat with your friend but you can't sing a song. That is the definition of a brisk walk. So, for any of these exercises to take effect, it will take about six to eight months because one remodeling cycle. The bone takes about three to four months. And it's so important that you need to con con combine strength training along with a balanced work because that is very important to prevent falls and related fractures. Um, Deshree has spoken about fracture and the mortality, so I'm not going to repeat. So balanced work added on to your exercise protocol. If you're doing two days of strength, one day of balanced work, and the other few days of aerobic activity, this will take care of your DMD. As a treatment modality, always under supervision, always with a good coach, um, because gym injuries are very common. High in intensity resistance training with weight bearing exercises. Now, weight bearing, this combination is supposed to uh, work as a best treatment modality. Uh, with this combination, they have seen an increase in the bone mineral density in the neck of the femur, spine, and hip. And it has to be done at least for a year for people to see gains. So you can't just work out for three months and expect magic to happen. It has to be done consistently. Consistency is the key here. Consistently under the supervision of a, a good coach. That was with exercise. So uh, three days of aerobic activity, two days of strength training, one day of uh, balanced work, one day of rest. That should be the composition of the week. Uh, moving on to sleep. Now, again, when it comes to exercise, just doing yoga is not exercise. I see this very commonly in my patients. They say, oh, we all exercise. What do you do? I do yoga. Now, yoga is good for your 
uh, flexibility and all that. But yoga alone cannot be compared to strength training. Sleep. We very rarely talk about sleep. And we do not pay much, much attention as clinicians to our own sleep. Does sleep have an impact on bone health? Very much has. Because we know a lot of repair happens during our sleep. And a lot of growth happens during our sleep. Um, so sleep, circadian rhythm disturbances can keep your body in a chronic state of inflammation, which can impair the balance between, you know, bone uh, osteoclast and osteoblast, and it can lower your bone mineral density. Poor sleep is associated with falls, increased fracture risk, um, because of the associated loss of balance and other things. And sleep associated with poor metabolism, which in turn can have an effect on the muscle mass and the bone mental density. In um, menopausal women, sleeping less than five hours affects BMD negatively. And we would see many patients complaining of sleep disturbances during the perimenopause going into the menopausal stage. Um, and that, there we need to understand and start, uh, you know, counseling them early enough. Uh, because there is a diurnal uh, variation in the bone turnover markers. There is increased osteoclastic activity at night, which is then followed by a good osteoclastic activity during the day. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons for women to lose sleep. Menopausal transition, the hot flashes that can disturb them. Increasing responsibilities of being a parent or family pressures. All this work on them along with a poor, many of them go through a lot of, uh, you know, depression and anxiety during menopause. So all this has to be addressed uh, when they complain of poor sleep. Do not neglect sleep in us. And I've been through very poor sleep during my entire transitioning phase. And I've really had to work very hard to get my sleep back in order. So there are several uh, barriers to sleep, as I said, medications, supplements, daytime sleeping for longer than 15 minutes, going to bed too full, having a dinner at nine o'clock and trying to get to bed at 9.30 will not work. Trying to catch up on lost sleep over weekends, you know, that's not compensating for good sleep. Too much of caffeine. Um, Jayshree said, yes, uh, caffeine does uh, have an impact on bone mineral density also. Uh, not aware that there's a problem, taking it lightly that, okay, it's okay if I don't sleep kind of an attitude, and having sleep disorders. How do you treat them? Uh, no devices in bed. Uh, many of us during COVID, I think, have gotten used to watching Netflix and Amazon Prime on our phone. No devices that definitely disturb sleep. Stimulants before going to bed. Coffee has a half-life of eight hours. So the last cup of coffee should be in the morning and not in the afternoon. Um, regular exercises will promote good sleep. Having a good sleep environment, a dark room, low, no noise rooms, keeping the room at the right temperature. Having a good uh, sleep schedule, uh, you know, going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time, not sleeping two hours extra on the weekend. All these have an impact on you. Sleeping very long is also poor sleep quality. Um, so having a sleep routine like bathing, showering before going to bed or reading a book before going to bed or having some listening to music it could be any relaxing activity before bed. And eating a balanced meal, for some people, a low-carb diet works in the night. For some people, a high-carb diet works. Decide which kind of a thing that you fall into. Uh, people who have an early dinner, it's good to go a little heavier on a cold carb. Um, people who have a later dinner probably reduce the carb effect. Uh, so not eating anything sugary, snacky at night, just before sleeping. All these things can disturb sleep. Does stress have an impact on the bone health? It has in two ways. One is directly um, because stress is, a, again, a chronic inflammatory state. It does uh, causes dysregulation of the HPA axis, hyperactivates the sympathetic system, and hormonal imbalances, which can lead to bone loss. Stress also induces a lot of behavioral problems like alcoholism, smoking, people who are depressed, don't want to exercise. They try to eat a lot of junk. So all these things can have a bearing on the bone health. So address them early enough. You know? um, getting 
people to practice some kind of relaxation or seeking help when they are the stress is not manageable levels and as as physicians addressing their stress also as an important factor for bone health all these become substance abuse and bone health it's very 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 important smoking process affects both osteogenesis and angiogenesis um indirectly they act through the body weight um parathyroid para para hormone and vitamin d access sex hormones adrenal hormones they cause a lot of oxidative stress on the body there are a group of things called calcium thieves smoking alcohol any irritated drinks sugary food they all are calcium thieves they reduce the calcium levels in the body um alcohol also causes malabsorption of calcium it reduces bone mass um substance abuse can also have a deleterious effect on bone mass i think as this generation the younger ones grow older they really do see a lot of smoking substance abuse and alcoholism in the young uh, no difference between boy girl it's the same cross uh, no sex difference so i think it's very important that we start addressing this at a very young age because uh, have these kind of habits can cause a bone mineral density decline even in the very young the social connections it's very important for us to age healthily to be connected socially this social connections can keep us happy and when we are happy we tend to do things properly right we care for what we eat what we uh, do how we move um so the harvard study uh, which was done in the uh, old students of uh, harvard in 1967 it's a very long drawn study which is even now active Gone, gone into the second and the third generation. I've seen people who lived the longest and who aged healthily are the ones who were socially connected. Um, this uh, blue zone is something that we like. Uh, if you've not watched the movie, please do watch. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's called The Secret of Blue Zones. Live to a hundred. Secret of Blue Zones. It's a beautiful documentary. uh and what is the lesson that it teaches you you see the women in okinawa and uh, greece and all that women live longer than men and you see them moving around at 100 they are doing every single activity in the house so they eat a diet that is rich in vegetables and bean a lot of legume consumption they keep themselves active through the day and they have a sense of purpose they wake up in the morning with a sense of purpose they exercise and they are all connected socially so that is what keeps them and uh, there are studies have been uh, its studies have said their cognitive impairment is very good even at 106 and um, they have no fractures and all that they're pretty happy healthy moving around um, and doing their day to day activities so this is something that the blue zones blue zones have taught us and it's high time we take cognizance of the fact and address every aspect of our lifestyle um well indian society of lifestyle medicine has memberships um through our membership you get to network with uh, people who practice lifestyle medicine um, across country across the globe and allied health professionals can also get memberships and you also get to write the exam and certify yourself in lifestyle medicine from the american college of lifestyle medicine and uh, we are having our fourth international conference in uh, chennai on november 4th and 5th i would like to welcome all of you um, please do attend there will be a lot of learning there and we have experts from across the country coming there to address uh, talk on various aspects of lifestyle um you can reach out to dr meera she will help uh, uh, with the registration links in case you are interested this is at hotel savera uh, on the 4th and 5th of november thank you thanks for the opportunity thank you ma'am thank you for the brilliant talk ma'am about the different lifestyle modification i am very inspired by you start walking from tomorrow ma'am thank you ma'am we have to start today tomorrow never comes preeti okay ma'am <laughs> thank you ma'am thank yes, you for this very inspirational one showing us a very good insights of how every aspects of your lifestyle plays a very important role in menopause and definitely as a most of us 
in the same group we should all get inspired from your talk that about the lifestyle which makes a very important role of uh, preventing most of the problems of the menopause thank you ma'am thank you for sharing that wonderful thoughts and in a good way and nice way thank you so much for being a faculty in this webinar thank you over to divya thank you chairpersons it was a wonderful session indeed now we move on to the next part of the program the much awaited quiz for delegates on bone health and menopause we have planned a series of five questions which will appear as pop ups on your zoom uh, screen once the questions are relayed you will have a time of 30 seconds to answer each question and at the end of the panel after the session 2 we will announce the winner of the quiz as well as the answers for all the five questions so the first question is relayed on the screen the best form of physical uh, activity for increasing the bone mineral density is a weight bearing exercise walking resistance training yoga you have 10 more seconds to answer this question delegates the next question uh, ma'am uh, the poll has been relaunched because one of the co-host has uh, okay stopped it so i have re relaunched the question so everyone can on answer okay okay the question one has been repeated once again please click your answers so last 5 seconds yeah time up so next question so second question the second question is the prevalence of osteoporosis in women over 50 in india is option a 10% b 20% c 50% d 30% the delegates can answer by clicking on the pop up screen which appears on your zoom platform last 5 seconds time up next question please third question who among the following needs to be screened for osteoporosis option a a woman aged 65 years with no medical issues option b a woman aged 55 years on visalon 5 mg daily for arthritis menopause aged at 50 years option c a woman aged 45 years with history of tbl fracture after a slip in the bathroom last menstrual period was 6 months earlier option d is option a and b option e is all of the above last 5 seconds time up fourth question the fourth question a 55 year old woman undergoing a dexa scan for complaints of bone pain bone mineral density is in osteopenic range what do we need to do next option a start bisphosphonate therapy option b start hrt option c calculate her risk of fracture by frac score option d repeat the dexa scan after 2 years answering is by clicking the relevant option on your zoom platform on the pop up screen last 5 seconds time up fifth question the final question of today's quiz a 50 year old woman with complaints of premature ovarian failure who was on hrt from the age of 35 years to 45 presents due to concerns about her bone health 
apart from dexa scan of l uh, dexa scan of ls spine and both hips you would also recommend which of the following option a dexa scan of the whole body b x ray pelvis and hips c heel bmd and d x ray ts spine ap and lateral Last five seconds. Time up. Thank you, delegates, for actively participating in this online quiz. This is a novel approach which we thought will encourage interaction between the delegates as well as the faculty. The results will be around at the end of the panel. So stay back and learn more. Thank you. So now we will move on to the second session of this academic bonanza on bone health and menopause. It is a panel discussion. I request the chairperson, Dr. Sumati. Can I uh, request Chitrakala for the CV of the chairperson? Yes, just a second. Yeah. Madam is a prominent face in the Gynecological Society of Chennai. Madam is the uh, director in charge of ISO KGH. We are proud to have her amongst us. She is a teacher with more than 25 years of experience, a master trainer in emergency obstetrics and a state trainer in colposcopy. She was the organizing committee member of OXI for 2022. Over to Madam to invite the moderator as well as the panelists for the next session. join Divya. Divya? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you just call up Sumati Ma and send them. Okay. Uh, I, mean, I have great pleasure in inviting Dr. Shopra Mahadevan, consultant at Sitapati Clinic and Hospital, a UG alumnus of Madras Medical College and a PG alumnus of Stanley Medical College. She is a member of uh, Royal College and uh, she was our uh, EC member and editor newsletter of the Chennai Menopause Society. And uh, she is a faculty in MRCOG revision courses with special interest in high risk pregnancy management, sexual and reproductive health. Of course, uh, her uh, sweet voice, she has been the official singer of Chennai Menopause Society earlier. So, welcome, uh, Shobana. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very kind words. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this wonderful opportunity. We have had three, two excellent talks. I think everything about uh, bone health preservation, screening, assessment, everything has been covered in detail. But uh, let us see if we can apply them to the uh, case scenarios or maybe... Uh, have the same um, information or issues reinforced by the end of the panel. To participate in this panel, I would like to call upon the uh, panelist, Dr. Jayashri Gopal, who uh, is a, one of the sought after endocrinologists in the city of Chennai. She's a very uh, highly acclaimed academician, very busy practitioner as well. They, they are all like walking encyclopedias for us. Whenever we have a doubt, we don't have to go and read the book. We just pick up the phone and ask them. The second panelist uh, is Dr. Deepa Tangamani, a very dynamic and busy obstetrician gynecologist. The third panelist uh, is Dr. Meera Raghavan, who is also the, uh, uh, she's a urogynecologist and also practices obstetrics and busy gynecologist. And she's also a lifestyle consultant. And the fourth panelist is Dr. Divya uh, Ravi Kumar, who has been uh, um, organizing, who has organized this uh, program. And she's a very young, dynamic obstetrician and a fetal medicine expert. We would love to hear her views on uh, uh, bone preservation of bone health and osteoporosis pres uh, prevention and treatment. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope. 
there's no glitch. So is the is it now in slide view? Yes, now we can see it. It's yeah. So uh, I think uh, uh, as practicing clinicians, for us to guide us through the management of uh, difficult management of menopause and uh, uh, osteoporosis management, we have uh, several guidelines. I think we should be aware of these guidelines periodically. They are updated. Our own Indian Menopause Society Osteoporosis guidelines has been um, uh, written by Dr. Meeta, which is very uh, country specific and very informative. What the question with Dr. Deepa Tangamani? So, uh, just briefly, Deepa, um, uh, when we talk about assessing bone health in our clinical practice, do you do for everybody or do you do a selective uh, assessment? Mm -hmm. Do you do uh, DEXA? Do you do clinical assessment or you do a combination of the above? Just quick. Uh, Thank you. I thank CMS for giving me this opportunity. Frankly speaking, Dr. Shobhana, um, so sitting in the clinic, gyne clinic, uh, talking about the bone health, uh, regarding when uh, regarding uh, to to the uh, clientele, like uh, going into the menopausal age group, is very very. I don't think uh, I, I am doing it uh, universally or selective or when the patient comes with pains, okay? To be frank, and uh, the patients we people gynecologists are seeing is like uh, when they come for uh, bleeding, irregular bleeding, menopausal irregularity only, we are having an opportunity to see these ladies. So in those ladies, we are, our concentration is mainly on that uh, menopausal uh, bleeding treatment more than that screening. So we need to give an opportunity to treat them. At the same time, uh, I like to talk about our colleagues who are all these in these age groups. Are they aware of their bone health? Are they aware of doing all the selective screenings or universal screenings? And all those people I have talked to them are uh, not doing any kind of a specific screening regarding that bone health. Having said, uh, even menopausal health screening, we are not uh, doing. So I am zero at it. Of course, uh, if they come with a uh, mosquito checkup patients, if they come with a DEXA scan report, that is an opportunity we are catching them. So we are really bad. I'm a really Thanks bad gynecologist. Frank. Thanks for being frank. Hopefully at the end of this uh, panel, we'll all change gears and I'm sure there'll be the change in our practice. Uh, we all know uh, this has been elaborately discussed in the two talks. What is the definition of osteoporosis? Uh, like Dr. Jay Shri very beautifully mentioned, it's not just the reduction in the bone mass, but microarchitectural deterioration, which doesn't show up very well on our DEXA scan. Now, when it comes to diagnosis, it is diagnosed. Uh, this was again uh, very uh, clearly mentioned in the talk. When the T score is uh, less than 2.5, or the presence of a fragility fracture. Now, Dr. Um, Jayashri would like to know this, uh, all of us hear about this fragility fracture, but I'm not sure if we all understand what it is. When do we call a fracture a fragility fracture? Jayashri? Yeah, uh, thanks, Shobhna. So in general, the way I, I think about it is a fragility fracture is a fracture that occurs in the larger bones of the body. So when I say a larger bone of the body, I'm talking about, of course, the spine, the hip, uh, the vertebral fracture, a hip fracture, but also tibia or femur or humerus. Uh, or, you know, if you sort of stretch it a bit, maybe a wrist fracture, but it will not include, for example, someone who has developed a metatarsal fracture, things like that. So it doesn't include the fractures of really the smaller bones, but a fracture which occurs with a fall from a standing height. So not, nothing which is, uh, we say a fall from a standing height. What about somebody who's got up on a stool to reach something and they fall? You know, I mean, again, technically that would be not really a standing height, but uh, it would come under the definition of a fragility fracture. So, but in general, for most practical purposes, we will take it as a fracture which occurs after a fall from a standing height. 
So a lot of times women fall when they are in, uh, you know, they slip in the bathroom. Uh, you know, gentle slip in the bathroom. That would qualify as a fragility fracture. Yes. yes. And sometimes when they go for mm -hmm. a walk with these yes. potholes and all of that, they do fall and have. So these are all the fragility okay. fractures. So uh, this is what uh, has been already mentioned. And uh, so we, uh, we have been told about what uh, osteoporosis uh, cutoff is and osteopenia cutoff is. And uh, when we look at the reports, uh, we get a little bit overwhelmed because so many numbers, so many different figures, T-scores and Z-scores. Just for a, a practicing obstetrician, could you briefly tell us what the Z-score is all about, Jai Shri? So Z-score is comparing it. Yeah, Z-score is what, when we compare it to the same age person, uh, we don't need to worry about it unless the person is very young. So really, we only need to look at the T-score. And if you want to look at the T-score, look at the T-score of the lumbar spine. They would have given an average, right? Okay. Uh, and then look at the hips. Now, let's say there is a big difference. So in the, in the let's say in the lumbar vertebrae, it is saying, minus 1.5 and the hips are saying minus 2.5. Which one do we take? Take the worst number. Take the number which is lower and diagnose it as osteoporosis. So always go with the lowest number. Now, okay. let's say again, uh, in the lumbar spine, you find that all of the values are minus 1, minus 1.5, but one value is suddenly like plus 1.3 in that lumbar 1 to 5. That is what they will usually check lumbar 1 to 5. Then ideally you have to look at the x-ray. If there has been a compression fracture, that will show up as a, because it's been compressed, that bone density will show up as higher on the, on the DEXA scan. So any sort of value that doesn't fit in, but in general, go for the lowest one. When do we look at the Z-score? If you have a woman who's premenopausal. So generally below the age of 45, they've had a DEXA scan for whatever reason. Then in that case, you have to go for a Z-score. Compare it with a woman of the same age. All okay. right. So this is a evergreen question. At what age would you recommend DEXA? I know there are any number of guidelines recommending after 60, after 65. So uh, I know uh, Deepa, I think you are uh, sitting in one of the places where there's a lot of master health checkups going on. And at what age they have the age-based packages, at what age do they include the DEXA? See, uh, uh, all well women age groups regarding postmenopausal, they have a DEXA included in the package. So say around more related. than 50. It is, it is not, not age related. More than 50, uh, if you go for that, uh, they have the package which contains a DEXA scan as a routine. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that is, uh, that is one thing. And uh, there is no age rate at more than 65 or more than 70. You have to have a DEXA and it's not like that. If they are coming with more like 40 to 50, probably DEXA and MAMO is not, DEXA and MAMO is, for, is not included. More than 50, they are including DEXA and MAMO in that. So that is what the routine packages we are following here. Uh, I'm seeing it in a master health checkups. Outside master health checkup also, they have a DEXA for almost all patients. Uh, if you take a woman package, uh, like even 30, 35 years, if you have taken a woman package, you end up in having a DEXA scan. Okay. So from the talks, we know that it is not necessary to do a DEXA scan. DEXA uh, under the uh, whatever age that we are going to come up with. These are the standard guidelines talking about women over 65 years and all the other clinical high-risk situations where we will do a DEXA. I think all this have been alluded to in the talks, uh, but we have our own uh, practice guidelines from the in Indian Menopause Society, which says uh, DEXA is recommended five years after menopause and earlier than five years, there are other risk factors. Now, the reason for this is because in India, they have quoted some uh, evidence, some studies, that the uh, age of menopause is earlier and uh, peak bone mass is accrued less as compared to Western population and fractures occur at an earlier age. Uh, see, we really don't know the actual incidence of osteoporosis. So we have to go with whatever limited information that we have. Therefore, it may be uh, better to modify. So, uh, so Mira, Mira, we haven't had Mira in a while. So, 
So again, these master health checkups keep coming and going. So how often do you think we should repeat big surface screening? If you take up, um, you take out the cost factor. So is there any role in repeating the earlier than two years? No, actually only if you treat them, then you would have to have a baseline and a repeat. Otherwise, if it is normal, you don't need to repeat for two years. And if there are any interventions given for osteopenia, you can maybe repeat lesser than two years, but not lesser than two years. Jayashree, is there any problem in repeating it every year? Is it useful to interpret if we repeat it every year? I mean, at least a minimum gap of, I would say, one year. There's no point in doing it before one year. Uh, there is no, I mean, it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis, I think. Mm -hmm. Someone it's was very not on the borderline and you're worried. Like, for example, today I saw a lady who had a, she'd had a previous DEXA showing a little bit of an osteopenia. And then she had a hysterectomy in December 2022. And in June, she had a DEXA which showed a decline. You know, immediately after your menopause, right, there is that sharp decline. Mm -hmm. Today she came to see me, sadly, with a vertebral fracture. But anyway, that is a separate thing. Mm -hmm. So just to say, it depends a little bit on uh, how... Clinical situation. Clinical, clinically, yeah. exactly. Also, Clinical. there seems to be some uh, artifactual variation uh, between uh, DEXA if you do it in a very short term. And we don't know whether the change is because of the artifactual uh, difference or the, uh, you know, whether it is a true improvement or worsening. So we'll go on to FRAC score, uh, Dr. Uh, Divya. So uh, in your practice, uh, I know we have spoken about this, that the, the FRAC score takes into account all the historical uh, clinical factors may or may or may not incorporate the bone mineral density. I just want to ask you, uh, when do you do the FRAX assessment? Do you do it in your practice? And if you do, uh, how do you, uh, and what is the implication? What is the purpose of doing the FRAC score? And if you, uh, what, Score, would you say, is abnormal and what is the implication? And is it country-specific thing available? The um, I use the FRAX score model, madam, because it's uh, one thing, it is freely available in the uh, web and uh, it is also country-specific. Though the data with which Indian uh, uh, values are given are not as robust as what we what is done for the Caucasians. It is still country specific. So I use the Prax model for uh, why, especially while counseling the patient. And when I have a borderline uh, report with osteopenia, and uh, uh, there are multiple risk factors for the patient, uh, uh, having such a tool will help me in substantiating my uh, diagnosis and starting therapy for that patient. So in that case, I find this tool very useful, ma'am. Um, uh, Jayashree, uh, how good is a FRAC score without uh, adding the... you? I know you mentioned that when there is osteopenia on DEXA, uh, then you would apply the FRAC score. What about the reverse, which is very often done? Because DEXA is not so freely available. You mean just calculate a FRAC score? Only the FRAC score without BMD. You cannot. You cannot because you, cannot. you need to put in the bone density in that. You cannot. Last bit in that is the bone density. So we cannot calculate it. Okay. So you mentioned 3% uh, risk of uh, hip fracture and more than 20% uh, non-hip fracture will be a trigger to start therapy, right? Start therapy, yes. So we'll go to one of the cases. So this is a 32-year-old woman who was coming for fertility treatment, is diagnosed to have premature ovarian insufficiency, and she's referred for oocyte donation program. It's a very commonly seen scenario, Mira. You know, so once we diagnose that and she goes for oocyte donation, we lose touch with them. Their whole focus is now on fertility treatment. So what advice would you give regarding her bone health before she goes and during the course of the treatment? Uh, definitely, this is the person we need to catch in spite of having a BC gynecological or fertility treatment practice like Deepa mentioned earlier. Mainly lifestyle interventions of maintaining a healthy lifestyle, uh, calcium in dietary uh, supplementation and uh, resistance training to maintain her bone health as well as a muscle mass. And apart from that, against obesity as well. Because I understand uh, premature ovarian failure 
um, can be associated with certain patients who can have obesity to work on their BMI, be it very less or be it more. So that, that will also maintain bone health. That was the first step with regards to advice regarding bone health. And she will be a candidate after the oocyte donation program or whatever it is. She should be on uh, hormone supplementation. And for her, after the fertility or whatever it is, she will be a candidate for going on birth control pills till the age of 50 or till the natural age of menopause, which itself is bone protective in nature. So Jayashree, uh, do OCPs provide adequate uh, bone protection as much as uh, our menopausal hormone therapy that we usually give in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal women? Definitely, definitely. Absolutely no doubt. Uh, they have, if anything, higher doses of estrogen. So definitely they have. So uh, in these women, they are all young. So DEXA, uh, what time would you plan to do? Most of us will not do it at the time of initiation because that's not what we are thinking at that point in time. But would you recommend that earlier in this group of women? In general, we don't need to do a DEXA. In fact, the only time I do a DEXA is if they refuse hormone therapy or they want to go off of hormone therapy. Like, you know, sometimes they want to stop after the age of 40. So then we do a DEXA and we have a discussion about, you know, do you want to stop your HRT now or do you want to, or whatever they are on OC pills or HRT, or do you want to continue? Uh, if they have a fracture while they are taking an OCP or, or they are on hormone replacement therapy, then definitely. Otherwise, not routinely needed because it would we would assume that they are being treated like any other woman who is going having her periods regularly. So we don't routinely do a DEXA for these women. Okay, thank you. I think that's a good clarity. So uh, we saw this in detail. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this. Alcohol to two units per day. Sorry, that's two units per day. So the next case, a uh, young girl, 19-year-old girl with advanced endometriosis. For some reason, GNRH analog has been chosen as the therapeutic modality. Deepa, uh, now what precautions will you take about GNRH therapy in terms of uh, bone health in this young girl? Dr. Deepa? Deepa, you're on mute, Deepa. Sorry, sorry. I'm the Okay. Uh, she is like 19 years old, guts. We all know that the peak bone mass will be reaching up to uh, 25 years. So in that age group, if you give a GNR agonist, this definitely uh, have uh, reduces a bone mineral density. So she definitely need an add back therapy for uh, if she is on GNRH or limit the use of GNRH like six months with an add back with oral contraceptive pills. So that's the one thing you have to do as long as he is uh, that effect on GNRH is that she has to have it. And uh, second things, rather than GNRH, now we have a Dynogest as an option, which is a progesterone only daily, which will have a sandwich therapy after endometriosis, medical sandwich therapy as an endometriosis that uh, doesn't decrease the uh, bone peak mass. So up to 25 years, any adolescent endometriosis, I would prefer using a Dynogest rather than GNRH. If GNRH is the drug, then we have to preserve the bone health by giving an add back. Yes, uh, I think Dianogist yeah. has been compared with this in adolescent uh, group in very uh, few studies, but uh, definitely it is superior in preservation of uh, bone mass. So we have to restrict the use uh, uh, to above the age of 18 only. Always use add back therapy, calcium and vitamin D supplements and the maximum duration that you can give is for six months only. Again, um, Mira, uh, what is peak bone mass and when is it achieved? What is its importance? And uh, Jayashree, is it different in the Asians? Uh, the mass, which is uh, in the main axial skeleton, which in the larger bones, which is accrued, that is achieved by age of 25. And after 30, it tends to decline, which is why we need to uh, importantly address nutrition in the adolescent and in the growth spurts and understand the fact that it declines after 30. So menopause, you tend to have further decline. And it is definitely different in the Asians, which is what the Indian studies have shown. And more so the decline happens in Indian women because of the early age at menopause. Okay. 
So we'll go on to the next case. A 45 year old with the last period one and a half years ago, BMI 25, no medical comorbidities. This is probably the commonest scenario we see in our clinic. And in this woman, uh, she uh, attained menopause at, at around 43 and a half. Will you assess her bone health? Divya, can I ask you? Uh, Deepa said yes. uh, she it's it's uh, you know uh, she's too busy or she's a bit uh, oh. focusing on <laughs> no focusing it's a on no, no, I'm sorry. complaints. So it she has come for something else, probably vaginal dryness or uh, hot yes. flushes or whatever. Will you assess her bone health, Divya? Yes. Uh... Madam, uh, what Deepa Madam said is actually the practical reality. We do assess the chief complaints with which the patient comes. But once you go around giving them uh, lifestyle, uh, lifestyle changes, telling them about diet and exercise, one thing is they, they hear it in our clinic, but outside they go and say, we came for one problem and the doctor is talking about another problem. She doesn't know. <laughs> and with my age, that, they think in that way. But... We are trying to inculcate the importance of lifestyle changes amongst our women. And I am a pro-diet and uh, uh, lifestyle modification, for pro-diet and lifestyle modification. I go into details of what is good for bone health. I tell them ragi has to be in the diet at least two, twice or thrice in their uh, part of their meal. And uh, I ask for their uh, history, whether their uh, uh, whether there is any family history of fractures or any uh, situations like that. And uh, I also make sure that the spouse attends the counseling. That way it is reinforced once again that diet and lifestyle is now part of uh, medical treatment. So yeah. I definitely uh, advocate yeah. diet and exercise in my consultation. Like many uh, conditions in our practice, no, we do opportunistic assessment opportunistic advice that's the best way to go because uh, doing it on a uh, larger scale is going to be practically impossible but we must strive to do that so um, what you're saying is you will do a risk assessment i think that's a very very important point you just don't write a prescription for bmd and then look at the uh, value you have to go through the history assess her real risk of course one of the risk is now she has an early menopause but Added to that, if she has any other risk factors, is what you should focus on. So, Jayashree, would you recommend a DEXA for her? Not right now, unless she has yeah, some other yeah. risk factor. Uh, some other risk factor, sorry. Okay. Or so, I think uh, uh, overall risk assessment and lifestyle advice is what we need to give her right now. And uh, again, uh, you spoke about 1,000 milligram uh, daily uh, requirement, uh, Jayashree. Uh, this is again reinforced in the ICMR recommendation. They say it's 800 milligram. And uh, again, um, it's very difficult to achieve this through the diet alone. But after going through Dr. Lakshmi's lecture, I think we need to be aware of what contains what. And we need the problem with a vegetarian diet is that you know you need to pick out a lot of stuff, do a lot of research, do a lot of planning in order to get the holistic uh, uh, you know, requirement uh, satisfied. So in the Indian diet, you did mention one liter will give you 750 milligrams of calcium, milk giving calcium. So uh, we went through the diet in detail in those talks. When do you measure vitamin D? Uh, I know it's a general question, but in the context of somebody with an early menopause, uh, would you recommend vitamin D assessment? So when do you do it? On, it depends a little bit on it. I mean, first of all, if they're having symptoms, yes. Some, you know, body pain, joint pain type of thing. Anyway, I think most people warrant at least 1,000 to 2,000 IO vitamin D per day. Uh, the only time I would try to measure a vitamin D or more importantly, a calcium before I give mega doses of vitamin D. So if I'm planning to give like a 60K weekly once for eight weeks, then I would definitely measure a calcium and a vitamin D before giving. But if I'm just going to give a thousand to two thousand IU vitamin D per day, I don't think there is any need to measure a, a okay. vitamin D. So only for a replacement dose you would measure, but for a maintenance uh, dose you need not measure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Lakshmi is not there, but I'll take Dr. Mira. Mira is yeah. the frac in general in vegan diet is the osteoporosis and fracture is increased and. Uh, 
what all should be included in a vegan diet to get adequate calcium there are I mean, fantastic sources of uh, calcium in vegan diet in fact our model 2 has all the calcium sources from plant based origin for the benefit of everybody in the aha column awareness about healthy aging uh, your uh, sesame seeds your chia seeds your cabbage and broccoli your ragi murunga keere are excellent sources of calcium up to 300 to 320 so you can take those on a regular basis for the calcium part of it your tempeh your soya also provides that you don't necessarily need daily and these are good non daily sources i also encourage you to watch game changers on netflix yeah. which shows you a fantastic uh, nutritional value of the vegan diet so there's no losing out on things if you're on a vegan diet to be honest i think the awareness and uh, execution of what we uh, you know plan to do i think that's the key it so, starts with the shopping so yeah definitely so uh, uh, we, i would urge everyone to be keeping on time also uh, you're having four to five we'll minutes skip this uh, mm-hmm. we'll skip this because jayshree also mentioned uh, pharmacological uh, treatment based on bmd and fraxco this is very clearly mentioned when you have osteoporosis on the bmd dexa uh, osteopenia with some uh, risk factors or a fracture would be the trigger to start pharmacological therapy so quickly jayshree i think this will be your question somebody who underwent th with bso at the age of 42 what should not have been done she was initiated into bisphosphonate therapy based on her uh, bmd her t score for the hip was minus 3.4 and for the femur was minus 3.8 for the uh, uh, spine and her bmi is 20 there's no fracture history in the mother or in her personal history how long will you give bisphosphonates and you mentioned a drug holiday why do you give a drug holiday so after about 4 to 5 years of using bisphosphonates the bone becomes what is considered a dynamic bisphosphonates act by reducing the bone turnover by osteoclasts so always for bones you need a healthy mix of building up breaking down building up breaking down if you stop it the bone becomes a dynamic that increases the risk of what is called an atypical fracture atypical fracture is a fracture in the uh in the shaft of the femur not in the hip but in the shaft problem is it's very difficult to treat uh, you know i mean you have to do a surgical treatment but after that healing sometimes is not proper uh so what is recommended is after about 5 years you do a bone density presumably i hope it would be significantly better than the score if it was if the bmd is remained the same i would not stop the bone density i would in fact consider giving say some teriparatide or something for a time before going back to a bone density but if it's remaining very low severe osteoporosis i would not stop it if it is improved then you give a break after 4 to 5 years and then uh, repeat a dexa after a year of stopping the uh, the bpd you also mentioned that uh, it, if it doesn't worse and that itself is a success of therapy with the uh, Uh, this first yes. minute also but then with a 3.4 i would assume that it should at least be at minus 3 or minus 2 i mean some improvement should be seen it's yeah. a very severe osteoporosis so uh, uh, quickly dr divya are all calcium salts the same we have a, a big uh, uh, group of calcium carbonate and citrate and uh, do you think anything uh, is one any one is superior to the others Yeah, uh, Jayshree. Calcium carbonate, citrate, uh, citrate malate. Only it comes down to tolerability, oral tolerability. Mm-hmm. So some are tolerated better than the others. Renal stones are not increased with calcium at a minimal dose, five hundred mg. Don't give large doses, one gram once a day. Uh, give five hundred mg. The concern more is routinely giving one gram, like Dr. Lakshmi mentioned, was associated between. in some large studies that were done was associated with increased risk of cardiovascular uh, uh disease so that's the reason why we don't routinely recommend relatively large doses of calcium for all people above the age of 50 but i think giving 500 mg in our country particularly if they are not able to meet their requirement per day is reasonable it's okay you okay. can always take a break every whatever like take it for 3 months leave it off for a month if you are worried about the stones if they have a history of renal calculi don't do it Okay. 
So I would just like to focus on with this one particular case quickly. A 42-year-old with breast cancer after surgery, RT and chemo, she's, she's amenorrheic. She's put on tamoxifen. A year later, we frequently find uh, this problem. She has a period and to suppress the ovarian function, she's given GnRH analog. Here, the again, the focus is on cancer treatment and uh, you know follow-up regarding that. So in her case, again, there are plenty of reasons to say that her osteoporosis risk is increased. Meera, uh, would you like to say a few words about this? Definitely. Uh, she has already increased risk because of the chemo. And if especially if we give letrozol, letrozol is also a very bone, um, anti-bone agent, if I may call it. And with this and her early kind of premature ovarian failure or insufficiency, she is at high risk for long-term osteoporosis. And she would become a candidate for um, anti-resorptive therapy and sometimes need even denosuzumab if they're not tolerated. So she needs assessment and treatment. So Definitely. Uh, most of them are tamoxifen. Generally, tamoxifen being a serum is actually in postmenopausal women, it is good for bone health. But in premenopausal women, it is actually, it, it increases the risk of osteoporosis and several studies have shown this. So I think with that, we come to the okay. end of this quick uh, informative panel. Thanks so much for all my panelists who made a very crisp, clear, uh, you know, uh, uh, messages. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I have one doubt with Dr. Jay Shigopal. Madam, uh, so you said, uh, uh, see, osteoporosis is a uh, management is a long term. Suppose you you are on yeah, those who are in the like uh, the one case with the severe osteoporosis, you are stopping that uh, uh, by bisphosphonates. Would you uh, would you like to continue with uh, some other drugs like say around the denoximab for lifelong? What how long denoximab can be given? Denoximab currently is lifelong. You cannot stop it. If you stop it, it actually there is a rebound in the particular fractures. So denoximab should not be stopped. Uh, okay. which is one of the advantages of bisphosphonates because potentially at the end of four to five years, you have a drug-free holiday if the bone density has improved. Uh, if after stopping it, again, bone density worsens, you have to put them back on it. There is no, there is no end. So, Mati, can conclude? I think we are running out we of We have to conclude, yeah. Yeah. I should really thank our uh, excellent uh, moderator and panelists but then Sumati, we are really nice to have uh, Sumati. Yeah, here. I'm sorry, I was not able to join during the introduction. It was an excellent panel and very informative. Yeah, and especially for the pan of uh, listeners, it is very excellent panel and uh, so much of information. Things which I could come from my memory or uh, things which are neglected is we are focusing more on reproductive health and not on menopause and things which are not known to many of the practitioners or uh, the younger generations or uh, the thing which is neglected is uh, shown in this uh, panel and I thank Shanti Madam for making arrangement for this wonderful panel and uh, it was excellent with uh, all the necessary information and uh, women has to be taken from adolescent not only till menopause, even after that, we are more, uh, focusing more on NCDs and other things. Quality of life is very important, and that is the era where we are. And I wish uh, uh, such webinars come again. And we as teachers should focus more on this to our younger generation so that they do practice in their future. Thank all the panelists. Was It was really a wonderful information. I should thank uh, Shanti Madam for giving me the opportunity to be the chairperson. Uh, thank you so much, madam. Thank you. Uh, we uh, have to uh, complete because uh, another webinar is going to be on. So I really thank all the um, uh, first the chief guest, guest of honor, then chairpersons, faculty who have graced this occasion and have made it a good academic experience. And uh, the person who won the quiz was Karpagam Swaminathan. I tried. Uh, contacting, but I couldn't, uh, Karpagam Swaminathan, uh, I called the number, but I couldn't get them in, uh, connect with her. So I we will just find out after that. She got four questions correctly out of five. So congratulations. And uh, I really thank all of y'all, uh, and especially team 
Chennai Menopause Society 2023-25 for having helped us to have this uh, good program. And SHIELD, I should particularly thank uh, both Chitraleka and uh, Sahiti Hello. for having helped us. And the, uh, of course, my dynamic secretary really plays an important role in that, along with our coordinator today for the function, uh, Divya Ravikumar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Good night. Can you take a photo, Meera? Sure, sure. Can one you all one. please come on, switch on your videos? Give me... Put. Our next webinar is on 11th. I think we shall take leave and join them. Thank you. On Thank breath. You. Thank you, ma'am.